So I walk into our final meetup for 2015, which is quite an achievement given the big start in 2012. Uh, I think it's very really timely and very fit that we have another meetup dedicated to practical machine learning. Was anybody here at our very first meetup at the beginning of 2013? Can I have a show of hands? I think it was me. Were you here? Our very first meetup? Wow, Justin, that's pretty impressive. So I think um, it would be Justin, Tavaria, and myself. And you may recall at our very, very first meetup that Tavaria Katana, who will be our second speaker tonight, gave us all the introduction to machine learning. And you may also recall that it was certainly a very detained talk because, um, again, the uh, sponsor beer was running freely and Tavaria just happened to have been the third speaker. So. Um, he had certainly enjoyed the sponsored beers by that stage, and it was certainly a very entertaining talk. Today, though, however, um, although he's still the last speaker, he's, um, he's been very careful to limit um, you know, the, the wonderful hospitality that our hosts at Optima have provided. And so I can assure you that it will be a very um, both entertaining and informative talk. So that's certainly one up. So, my name's Rami, and um, I really appreciate everyone here joining us again. I'd like to take um, a moment to give a very special thanks to our host here at Optima. Um, they extremely generous in hosting these meetups and providing the beer and the pizza. Um, without them, my life would be extremely difficult, and it would be a far more commercial meetup. So, we really appreciate that, and I'd like to hand over for just a few announcements. This way, there we go. Well, thanks very much, Rami, and uh, welcome everybody. It's certainly our pleasure to host, I think, the second Big Data Meetup that we've had. Third Big Data Meetup that we've had at Optima, and hopefully we'll have many more. Uh, so who are we? Uh, Optima is a global financial markets market-making company. Uh, we're almost as excited about Big Data as you guys are. Um, our mission is to improve the market, so we're a high-frequency trading company and we provide bids and offers in uh, exchange-traded products. Out of this office, our primary markets are Hong Kong, uh, Japan and Korea. If that doesn't mean anything to you, well, there are plenty of Optiva people around this evening. Optiva people, wave your hands, please. Just thank you very much. Um, hang around for a chat afterwards. We'd love to tell you a bit more about what we do. Um, but without further ado, I'll make a couple of housekeeping announcements and then hand over to Rami. Um, so, toilets are there, uh, pizza is just around the sides, so hopefully you've already enjoyed some, and there's a beer fridge up the back. Um, please, uh, we respect, uh, please, we uh, would love to have a chat with you after the meetup, but if you could leave the building by 9pm, uh, all visitors need to be up by 9, that would be really appreciated. So thanks very much, uh, and over to you, Rami. Thank you. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our um, first speaker, Ted Dunning. And in the process of doing so, I would like to acknowledge a um, thanks to Matt Barr, who have, I guess, um, brought both Ted and Alan Friedman to us, acknowledge the fact that we've got two you know, very, very um, instrumental committers to, I guess, both the open source and ecosystem community in machine learning in Hadoop. And so we're very, very fortunate to both have Ted and Ellen here tonight. I understand it's their, both their first trips to Australia, and um, you know this is a very exciting um, opportunity for us here, you know, on the other side of the ocean, to have exposure to, um, I guess, some some really, really key members of the community. Um, so Ted, um, who, if you don't know, has been a very, very instrumental committer to um, both ecosystem projects, um, Apache projects, and very much so in the machine learning space, um, including the house and other projects. Um, he also um, does claim, and I do believe this, that, that Ted was actually the um, first person to sponsor beer at the very first Apache Hadoop meetup. So I think that's certainly um, something to certainly claim food of. Um, very, very exciting given that you know we've had three years of great um, Hadoop user group meetings. So um, it's, it's really um, exciting to have you here. And, He'll be talking tonight about really practical machine learning and what our limbs really matter. And in doing so, we're very fortunate, thanks to my mind, to actually have two copies of Real World to do, both by Ted and Alan, and those co authors. These are signed copies, so we have two signed copies. Ted will be running a quiz of one question at the end of his talk, and the first person that actually gets the answer right, unfortunately, can only be one that gets the answer right um, first and we'll be reading the first copy, and then at the beginning of Tiberio's talk, 
he'll be running another quiz, and the first to answer that question right will get the second copy. So um, put your thinking caps on, don't drink too much before um, I guess Tabaru comes on stage, and without much further ado, I'd like you to put your hands together for Ted. You should drink enough, because the question will have to do with beer. <laughs> Seems appropriate, given the reputation here. Uh, so, what I want to talk about here is which algorithms really matter. Not necessarily which ones are fun or cool or things like that. Uh, as Well, I guess he said all this. Uh, we do a lot with open source at Nampar, we do a lot with uh, additional IP as well. Uh, I'm VP of Incubator at Apache and on more projects than I can remember. I think I counted recently one to nine. But um, what I want to talk about more, I want to take the MapR hat off, and I want to talk about what's important in an algorithm, uh, why that's important, and what's the difference from academic research, and then several examples of what I consider important algorithms. So to me, an important algorithm is not necessarily the same as an earth-shaking or a mind-boggling sort of algorithm. The first property that I prize in an algorithm is it's deployable. And by deploying, it means that I give it to somebody and they run it. They can install it, start it. Any chance that we could turn down the volume on this just a little bit? Uh, they can install it and run it and so on. Clever prototypes, as clever as they may be, don't really count. Maybe I'll find a better place to stand. Uh, because they, they have a hard time being standardized. I remember once upon a time, uh, we had two machines that were brand new. One was one of the first Sun workstations, and one was an early Lisp machine. The Sun workstation came, reinstalled, turned it on, it worked. The Lisp machine came, and a guy with a PhD came to install it. Which company succeeded? I'd say the one that was deployable. Didn't need a PhD to turn the computer on. I think that robustness is very important. My goodness. I think robustness and transparency are really important. Robustness because an algorithm that's robust can accept abuse uh, in terms of misconfiguration or overload, things like that. And transparent is important so that you can tell when you do abuse it that something has gone wrong so you know when you need to fix something. And I think that you need to match the skill set and mindset that's needed to run these things with the people who will be running them. You can, you can think of sometimes that there's kind of like two axes of computer people. One is the novelty-seeking inventor sort. And these people can be really good at running a system for about five weeks. And they get bored. Sixth week, they do an okay job. The seventh week, something happened that was more interesting, and they missed a lot, and things fell over, and it's horrible. The other axis is the people who are the doers the people who make lists and make sure that every task gets done. The first kind of people make lists, too, in order to make sure they can figure out what the coolest thing to do is. They only expect to do 5 or 10% of the things they put on the list because the others are boring. The second kind of people really, really, really want to get to the bottom of the list, and they like things that are stable. They don't like surprises, unlike the first people. And so, the second kind of people are the ones who can run something and keep it running for a long time in a very stable way. You want to be able to have an algorithm that you can hand those people and go off and seek novelty again. And that's often not the case with academic algorithms. And I think you need to be proportionate about your effort. If it's really hard to develop an algorithm, really hard to tune it, and you only get a little bit of lift in, in whatever value you want, that's not very good use of your time. If an algorithm is super easy to install, and boom, it just works, and you get high value in a short amount of time, that's a great algorithm in terms of proportionate value. Now, academic goals are very different. Academic goals are reproducibility, so that other people can reproduce your research. 
That's good in science. Otherwise, it isn't really science. In industry, you really don't want other people to reproduce your results. You want to be unique. This is exactly the opposite. You want to isolate particular aspects, theoretically important aspects, in academia. And in business, you want to make things synergistic. You want to have them as unisolated as possible. And you want to isolate them so you can maintain them, but you want them to build on each other. You want to work on novel problems in academia, and novelty is almost an anti-pattern in an industrial setting. So pragmatics leads to almost all the opposite conclusions. So these are the things that I find important. And here's some examples. One is recommendations. Recommendations seems well trod. There are dozens and dozens of papers on the subject. And almost all of them take an academic point of view. They want to see novelty. They want to be reproducible. But recommendations don't really work that way. And in fact, if we were to ask, what is the most important? Let's try this. Maybe it's an AGC, and I can just move it up closer, and we'll be safer. Uh, what's the most important algorithmic advance over the last 10 years in recommendations? Some people might say co-occurrence analysis. That's what I worked on a lot. Some people might say matrix decompositions and completions, like singular value decomposition. Variants on them are what won the Netflix challenge. Latent factor log linear models are kind of cool. They have more L's than any of the other options. <laughs> uh, what's also cool academically, uh, or temporal dynamics. People change their mood. If you model that, maybe you can do better at estimating ratings. My feeling that none of these are the most important pragmatically in terms of algorithms. I think the most important advance in recommendations over the last 10 years is the addition of random numbers to your results. That's kind of a bold statement. Result dithering is literally random, adding randomness to your results. We take a recommender which produces the best recommendation that we can do, and then we corrupt the results. And that makes things better. That is odd. That's counterintuitive. And compared to all of these algorithms on this page, all of the different algorithms here make single digit percentage improvements or unimprovements in performance. Dithering, adding random noise to the results, can improve performance by 100% or more. It's 10 times more effective. And it's enormously easy to do. You can do it in minutes to hours. And so the bang for the buck is massive. So I think that's important. Anti-flood is a little bit more obvious. obvious. Don't just recommend the same thing or close variants of it over and over and over and over and over again. That also gives you 100% or more lift. Let's talk about dithering instead. So as I see it, the real problems in recommendation are that today's recommendations are tomorrow's training data. Recommenders are unlike other machine learning systems. So for instance, if I have a credit card, and there's a machine learning algorithm behind this which looks for fraud and tries to avoid fraudulent transactions. So if I have that algorithm there, it will be trained on all the transactions that happen. Now it has a slight problem that if it rejects algorithms, it does or uh, transactions, it doesn't find out if they're fraud. But most of the transactions happen regardless. And so it has training data that is the training data. There is no real choice. But the recommender, it's going to recommend something to you, and then it's going to look as to whether or not you liked what it recommended. If it didn't recommend something that was fabulously good, which is exactly what you've been looking for, it will never find out that's what you wanted. And if it always puts that item kind of low in the list, it will never learn which people like that thing. So exploration is a key factor in making these algorithms good. They have to explore around what they already know. If they just do what they know, they learn about what they already know. If you add a little bit of reshuffling in the results, they learn about things near what they know, 
and quickly latch on to things that are much, much better. And that's why the other algorithms cannot do any better on a static reproducible problem is because the training data does not change. The difference that Dittery makes is it gives you more broad training data. And so any algorithm then can find the best hits. Diversity is also an answer, and that's the, the basic idea of getting better things. Speed is also very cool because if you give results very quickly, people impute quality to those results. And dithering can be implemented with just a few random number generations. It's extremely fast. OK, so what we do then is which all we're going to do is we're going to reorder the results. We're going to generate 300 results, and we'll reorder them and display the top ones after reorder. Now, if we started with the best ordering we know, then reordering them like that is guaranteed to make the results worse today. But it, making them worse today is going to make training data better tomorrow. So then the baseline system that we're making a little bit worse is much better. And so the system quickly gets better and better and better once we start dithering and exploring better. I've worked with probably two or three dozen companies, and some of them have hundreds of client companies who use recommendations. Everybody who's adopted this technique says it's made more difference to their results quality than any other. It's just almost exactly the words they use. So here's how to do it. What we do is we take the rank, and you can imagine if we took the rank, say 1 to 300, and we just added a fixed amount of random noise to that, it would displace elements kind of proportional to the size of the random noise. If the random noise is about 10 in size, then the first and 10th element might invert relatively often. If the size of the random noise is 2, the first and 10th elements will rarely, rarely re reorder. The first and second might reorder. The 20th and 22nd would reorder a bit, but the 20th and 30th would not reorder. That's not the behavior we want. We want the first few elements to be very stable. We want the probability of switching the first and third element to be kind of like the probability of switching the 10th and 30th element. We want a proportion of the rank to be perturbed. And so by taking the log of the rank here and adding random noise to get a synthetic score and then sorting on that score, we get exactly that behavior. You can see how if we add a constant to the log, that's equivalent to multiplying the rank by some factor. And so the change in the rank is going to be proportional to the rank times an exponential of epsilon, usually in that range. And by the way, there's a trick here. People will not click to a second page of recommendations. They just won't, whatever reason. Very, very few people will. But there's two factors. If they come back to the page soon and the results are the same, they, according to reports to people I've asked, feel like the report results are fairly stable and therefore of high quality. If they come back an hour or two from now and the results are different with no change, they go, oh, not only is it good and stable, it's finding out new things. Now, what they're finding out is that I've changed the seed of the random number generator. And so I do the four time divided by the hour for the seed. That means for an hour it stays stable, and then it changes. It's mostly kind of the same. The top elements are the same. And so if they see stability in there in the change, and they see absolute stability if they refresh the page, and they feel better. And the result is people will come back to the first page of recommendations even though they won't come to the second page. The second page is one click away, and the recommendations page is usually two clicks away. Users, they're crazy. Uh, but they're crazy in a nice quantifiable way. You can learn how to use their behavior for their benefit. Here's an example. Now we're using epsilon 0.5, so exponential of that is the square root of e, which is something. Yeah, who knows? It's 1.6 or 1.5, something like that. And so we should expect 1 and 2 to invert reasonably often. You can see 
that the first element is almost always the best element, according to the original ranking, or the first element is always in the first and second place. So the first element can go that far. Now if we look, how deep can the fourth element be? It should have been originally in this range. Each row, by the way, is a reordered list of numbers. I took 300 numbers and I reordered them according to the formula and I showed the first eight. So each row is a dithered sequence of integers, which were originally in order. So the fourth element has been displaced down to here. It's off the end there. It's up in the top here, top here. It's right there in the second one here. It's off the top, top here, there. So the fourth element is behaving a lot like the first element was, but it's in this range of twice four. So the fourth element is appearing in the top eight just about as often as the first element is appearing in the top two. See, it's ratio thing. Two to one, four to eight. So it's doing scale relative stirring. And we can see we've gotten in the top eight, these 24th, the 12th, the 13th. It's pulling things from deep in the results list and showing it on the first page. That's kind of a synthetic way of forcing people to see things on the second page. Seeing them then gives the recommendation engine information about whether or not they like them. This is the cheapest hack ever. Here it is when we increase the log, uh, or the epsilon to two. Now you can see that the top element can go much deeper. It's no longer always in the top two. It's almost always in the top three, except when it goes deeper, and so on. And you can see we're getting much deeper results into this results list. So we're mixing more. Just by turning the knob, we mix more, turn it back down, we mix less. We turn it back down to zero, we mix not at all. OK, so this is what click-through rate on a normal system looks like. And you can see there's no click-through rate on second and lower pages. So if we were just to take this thing and put it up here, we would learn who would click on it. That's the idea. Exploration is very, very good. So this is what I think of as an important algorithm. I didn't say it was complicated. I didn't say it was deep. I didn't say it had advanced mathematics in it. In fact, all of those could be considered misfeatures, anti-features, because they would make it less deployable, less runnable, less stable. This is bulletproof. Let's take a second example. This one's a little bit more interesting in an academic sense. So the idea here is we want to do a little bit more principled dithering. We want to do, because dithering is good, how much dithering is good? A lot is bad, a little is bad, something in the middle is better, how much? We can learn to trade off that exploration and exploitation optimally using this algorithm. And this is the best known, as far as I know, algorithm for this particular problem. It's incredibly simple again. Uh, it has fancy mathematics, but it doesn't make it complicated. Let's switch, skip that page. The idea here is that we estimate whatever parameters of our system we have, but we estimate them in a sense of getting a distribution of possible values, not a single point. Once we have that distribution of possible values, we sample from that distribution. Normally what people would do is take the mean of that distribution and estimate a particular value. So if I have a coin, this is a coin. There's heads, there's tails. We're going to estimate a parameter. The parameter is the probability of heads. What's the probability of heads? He says half. He says it very quietly. It turned out heads. OK, let's go around the room. What's the probability of heads? It came out heads. OK. I, I should mention that my first job was a, as a magician. Uh, OK, half, it's heads again. Uh, I'm going to skip you because you know me. Uh, there would be a probability of heads. Half, it's heads again. Um, probability of heads. Oh, these people have all been to school. <laughs> it's hard to get. Now, what? He, he, he's beginning to get the idea. So, let's go back. 
what's the probability of tails? Half. What's the probability of something else? <laughs> okay. So we should reserve a little bit of humility in the possibility that the universe will surprise us, or the bastards who's giving the talk will surprise us. Uh, and so the idea here is that we don't want to commit to a particular value. We don't want to commit to a value. So if we were using Bayesian logic or something like that, we would have assumed after a few trials that maybe it's a little bit higher than a half and somebody in the back jumped to all the way to, to one for the probability. But if we had two coins and one of them came up heads two or three times, the other didn't come up heads at all. If we were eager about that answer, we would have committed to an estimate of something like 0.55 or 0.67 or something like that for the heads on that coin if we didn't have a very, very strong prior assumption about it. And the other one, we might say, well, maybe it's a little bit lower. And then we just commit, we would only ever show this coin again if we were estimating the probabilities, because we would pick whichever one had the highest estimate. But if we're sampling, both of those estimates are very uncertain. And so we might sample high or low on either one. We would probably show the heads one more, but not exclusively. Here's a video that shows this sort of thing happening. And the idea here is that we have five coins. And I'm going to show you the answer this time. I'm not going to cheat again. Uh, we have five coins. Purple, blue, yellow, sorry, green, yellow, and red. This is the probability of turning out heads. Red is the best. We can see that because we have the God's eye view here. This is not visible to the experimental apparatus. Yellow is only a little bit worse. Purple is horrible. The system does not know this at this time. It has no idea what's good, what's bad. And as such, the distribution of probabilities, well, it's tried blue once, and it came up tails. But the distribution of probabilities for the others, it's saying, I don't even know their coins. So it could be anything. So they're all basically the same. And the probability it's going to try any given coin is all equal. And down here is a quantity called regret. If we show red, we have zero regret. That's the best we can do. If we show yellow, we have a small regret, this big, because yellow is almost the best. If we show purple, we have regret this big. So what's the average regret? It's the average of all the things we're showing and how much worse they are than the best. Of course, we don't know what the best is, so only the simulated system can tell us what the current regret is. And watch what happens. After just a few tries, so we've tried uh, red once, twice, and it's heads once, tails once. So we have this very broad estimate of its probability. Yellow we've tried three or four times and come up all but once, heads. So right now the system says yellow is probably a bit better than red. But purple and blue have never come up positive at all. And green is hidden by some other graph. So the probabilities are such that it's giving yellow more instances of trials than red, and the regret has already come down by half. By just suppressing the ones that seem much, much worse, even though it's still trying them, by suppressing them, it has already improved its scores. And so if we go further. Here, yellow is still a bit better. The others are getting worse, and so regret is continuing to go down. If we just let it run, you'll see it mostly converge pretty quickly where red is better, yellow will make a run back up for it, and the other ones are marked as losers, and it won't even try them much at all. See right there, the losers are getting almost zero traffic. Yellow accidentally went way low, too low. Here it's come back up, it came back up better than red for just a moment. And now, you can see the bad ones very occasionally will take a little hop. But the estimate for red is becoming more and more narrow. So the system now says 80% chance that red is the best, 20% or so chance yellow is best. But those are variable because we keep trying new experiments. And the others are down near zero. And the regret has dropped to near zero as well because we're showing red most often where the regret is zero 
We're showing yellow some where the regret is small, and we're showing the really bad ones where the regret is large, almost not at all. So the average regret is very, very small. So this is Bayesian learning, but it's also Bayesian active learning. Call it Bayesian bandage because it's a multi-armed bandage problem. This can be applied in much more complex systems, and it's currently used for ad targeting by Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, and about five other companies that I've worked with. It's a very effective algorithm, and indeed is the best known algorithm for this problem. Let's go back to slides. And it's really just those two lines. Estimate and take the bis biggest, or sample, don't estimate, and take the biggest sample. That's all it is. It's that simple. Here it is against one of the algorithms that's commonly recommended for A-B testing on the web. That's Epsilon Greedy. And Bayesian Bandit is two to four times better, even when we don't even tell it that it's just a coin that could be zero or one. We get a very, very broad possibilities and it just smokes the competition. Here it is in a more uh, even-handed comparison. This was by Yahoo on internet advertising. The blue one is Thompson sampling, which is this Bayesian bandwidth idea. So we have a very, very simple algorithm for a very difficult problem that took decades to solve, and it's the best one there is. This is cool. It's deployable because the sampling is a very simple thing. It's one line of R. It's a few lines of Java, a few lines of C, and it's the best there is. It's easily stable because it can recover from errors if you just let it forget. It's really a remarkable thing. And we could still use dithering. Dithering is kind of an approximation of this thing. So where this thing is saying, I know or I don't know, and when I don't know, I'll try different things. As I begin to learn and know very certainly which one's the best, I focus on that. Dithering is doing a little bit the same thing, except with a constant estimate of knowledge or ignorance. We can tune that down as we learn more and get very much the same effect, but this automatically tunes itself. So exploration, even theoretically beautiful exploration, is pretty darn easy to implement. That's an important algorithm to me. So here's another one. And the, 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 this is an instance of a very general algorithmic approach called sketching. The idea is we have enormously big data, huge data, and the idea is that we'll make one pass through the data and make a small thing which characterizes all of the important characteristics of the big thing. It's not downsampling. Downsampling would forget the rare things. This sketch will remember the rare things and it will carry all of the important characteristics of the data with it. So then we can do our expensive algorithm, in this case clustering, on the sketch, not on the original data. So we want one very fast pass through the original data and then cluster the sketch versus making many passes, many expensive passes through the original data, and then you find that we have to restart the algorithm many times anyway to be sure we have a reasonably good solution. This is enormously better than classic clustering. K-means clustering is useful in a number of ways, say for feature detection, for machine learning, uh, at high scale and high dimension. The number of classes, number of clusters increases though, and the algorithm's cost increases in both dimension and the number of clusters and the amount of data, this is like cubically bad. It's really, really non-scalable. We also have to go through the data many times. It's very, very not nice how this scales. So in, in fact, anything that scales more than linearly is unscalable. We must never pay more for a new piece of data than we paid for the first. So sketch-based stuff produces the sketch. It uses an adaptive clustering to produce a clustering of the data with many, many, many more centroids than we ultimately want. I'll show you why that works well. And the size of that sketch grows very, very slowly with the number of data points we've seen. And so this stays in memory, very nearly constant, can be parallelized easily, and it works really well. So look, if we look at this data, it, we might say, oh, it's hard to cluster or something like that. In fact, no, it's easy to cluster. This is what it looks like if we cluster. We have clusters arranged in a spiral. 
And in fact, I happen to know, since I generated the data, that it is a spiral with noise about that big added to it. And so putting clusters that are about that far apart, about twice the size of the noise, is about as good a description as we can get of this. And saying that a point is here or here, you know, if it's actually right here, saying it's right there where the nearest cluster is, we are only making an error that's proportional to the noise that's in the system anyway. By doing that, we compress every data point down to about four bits. Very, very strong compression relative to the original two-dimensional data. We can do a little bit more, like two bits plus a sign, two times what are the two nearest clusters, and a sign bit, which side of it is it on, and we get even smaller error. Compression has an interesting property that if you can compress data very, very well, you understand it. You understand the truth of the data. Any representation that allows you to compress data heavily has very deep, deep and special connections to the true distribution of the data. This, when I was talking about the distribution of the coin there, if you could predict it, I mean, let's, let's think about this. You know, with the coin, if we, if we flip it and I ask you, is it heads or tails? You say, well, he says heads now. <laughs> okay, so you're gonna say something kind of like 50-50. Am I gonna say 50-50? No, what's the difference between, oh, well, I'm not gonna ask what's the difference between us, but if I let you see the coin, are you gonna say 50-50? No, he says. What's the difference between you now and you 30 seconds ago? Now you know. So he has been anointed now as a Bayesian. He represents his ignorance or his knowledge, his initial ignorance and his later knowledge of what the coin was at, as probability. When we talk, when we work mathematically, what we are saying when we say probability is a subjective thing. He and I gave different answers. And it is a measure of what we know. If we can compress something very, very tightly, we can predict it. If we can predict it, we have removed the uncertainty from the system. And so compression like this, just through clustering, is a very exciting thing. It also diagonalizes. That means we can run various algorithms much more efficiently. It's untangling the spiral and representing it now in a higher dimensional space, in the 20 dimensional space, of which only one coordinate or two have interesting values. We can take data like this, you know, it's four different clusters, the different colors spattered up. There's more red points than there are cyan points and more than there are purple points. But if I throw a lot of clusters at this, that's what the little triangles are, is clusterings of this, I can get a pretty good estimate of the distribution, the four humpy distribution of the data. And if I get a good representation of that, I can then cluster the triangles instead of the original data. So the triangles make an interesting sketch of data. It compresses well and it results in the same clustering we would have had the original. This is how clustering fails. It's when we put us two initial position clusters up here, two initial estimates of clusters up in there, and only one in down here, and then one each in these clusters. These two centroids never leave that cluster. The one down here has to kind of average out, and we can never escape that. So we have to start the algorithm over and over again. But if we put five times as many starting points up there, five times as much initial condition clusters up there, we would have, on average, five clusters, plus or minus three, in every one of those clusters. And we would be guaranteed, almost, that one of those sketch clusters would be in each one of the real clusters. And so the resulting sketch would almost certainly be a good representation of the data. So we then cluster the sketch, and get an accurate clustering of the real thing. So all we do is take, if we want k clusters at the end, we explode the number of clusters that we use in the sketch, and then we use a very sloppy, very fast, one-pass clustering to 
get the sketch. Once we have that, we can cluster the sketch in memory very fast. And we can even do many instances of it because it's in memory very easily. And there's an alternative algorithm called adaptive DB means, which works for making the sketches. So this is an important algorithm. It makes an important task that we have much faster. It removes knobs from the system. It removes restarts. It makes it much more deterministic. It's a very cool and important algorithm. And it leads to other algorithms. This kind of sketch, or related sorts of sketch, can be used for other hard problems. Sketches make big data small, and therefore make big data problems much smaller. This is cool. Search ideas. Remember I talked about recommendations and things like that. The basic idea of recommendations is we watch a crowd, we watch idiosyncratic behaviors in a crowd, and we learn about an individual. Now individuals don't have just boring, uniform personalities. They have kind of multiple personalities in a nice way. So what we need to do is factor those out and find aspects of these people that are similar to other people, aspects of other people. It's a complex problem. Now, here's a simpler example. Alice got an apple and a puppy. Charles got a bicycle. Bob walks in with an apple. Can you say what a good algorithm would recommend to Bob? He has an apple like, like who? He has an apple. Like who? Who else has an apple? Yes, exactly. This is confoundingly simple. So it's confusing. I'm like, this is so simple. And so is Bob? This is not the contest question yet. Uh, Bob is not like Charles, because Charles has a bicycle. He has no apple, right? He has no history of apple consumption. Bob is only plausibly like Alice among, I mean, this is big data. It's this big, right? Maybe not the big data we normally talk about. So we would recommend to Bob what? I'm going to insist. <laughs> what, what, what should we recommend to Bob that he get next? A puppy. Because Alice got a It's so touching, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, we should recommend a puppy. These are not large numbers, so these are not certain conclusions. This is simplified so much as to be absurd and confusing to say anything about it because it's so absurdly small. I, I sympathize with you. Um, I don't sympathize with me for asking you. Right? <laughs> Sorry. Um, anyway, Bob also wants a pony, by the way. Anybody here want a pony when they're a kid? She wanted a pony. She wanted a pony. I wanted a pony. Come on. I know you wanted a pony. Uh, even in Australia, I'm sure that's a universal. Everybody wants a pony. And so if everybody wants a pony, when Amelia comes in and exhibits interest in a pony, is bold enough to raise her hand, like many of you were not, although I can see inside your hearts. When she comes in and wants a pony, now the problem is hard, because that's like everybody. So we don't learn anything from the co-occurrence in this case. Ponies co-occur with everything, everywhere, and so there is no pattern to be seen. With Apple, there was a pattern. With ponies, there is no pattern because of the ubiquity. If everybody gets a pony, it's not a good indicator what else to recommend. So these are the... That was odd. Ah, uh, thank you. I love Microsoft. I could tell if you were tele giving a talk. It seemed like a good time to just fall over. This is the time when you don't want builds in your slides. Foolish, foolish me. Come on. Well, it was a quick review, anyway. <laughs> what is Bob one? Puppy, puppy, right? Okay. Amelia, who knows? Okay, so the basic problem here is co-occurrence is the fundamental operation we want to see, but there is ubiquitous co-occurrence with ubiquitous things, with ponies. What we want to do is we want to take the history matrix of who wanted what, 
transform that into co-occurrence, and then find only the interesting co-occurrences, nothing with ponies, to get what are called indicators. Then we can take just the indicators, and the indicator for puppy is just the apple, and we can put a pup, an apple down here in the search document for a puppy. This allows us to use search, search with a query that is behavior, to retrieve items which are indicated and therefore recommended. This is a way of turning a search engine into a recommender. And here's an example where we show that it exhibits remarkable acumen about music. Popular CEO was a guitarist who started with flamenco music. I think there's a popular CEO fan here who remembers, sadly he's gone. Uh, he died two years ago. Uh, but he took that and he put jazz influences into it to produce what he called a new flamenco. A very interesting variation on it. But in the database that we're searching here, of a million videos, there are no Pocket Lucia videos as far as we can tell. So when you search for Pocket Lucia using text search, you find Hombres de Paco. Hombres de Paco. De and Paco. Two out of three words match. So the text engine goes, yeah, must be awesome, and finds 400 episodes of that, and they're all wrong, just like the first one was. It, and it finds basically nothing else. It's really a horrid result. On the other hand, if you use recommendation-based search, where we look at the co-occurrence of words people type with the videos people watch, not as a result of that search, but any time, before, after, within a week, that sort of thing, words that they type and videos that they watch, here's what we get. Here's the Elmer's de Paco apocalypse, uh, horrible results. And here are the recommendation-based verb. So the top hit there is somebody playing Ciudad de las Ideas. That's a Spanish classical piece. But look at the guitar he's playing on. It's a semi-acoustic electric jazz guitar. Presumably, they're not playing it in a dead standard classical way. Notice how the guitar is nearly horizontal. So they're not a classical, but they're playing classical Spanish music, presumably with a bit of a jazz touch. Not a bad hit for Pagodosia. The second one is a little bit more difficult to understand. It's a number of women dressed in black. It's a dance group called COD, and they're dancing the Bolivia, which is a flamenco dance. Not a bad hit. The third one is Ciudad de las Ideas again, but now played on a Spanish classical guitar. It's not as good as the first hit. The fourth one is Van Halen. Van Halen. It's a 17-second clip of Van Halen doing a classical guitar riff during a concert, which is kind of crossover with classical guitar. The bottom one is kind of cool. It's not really great guitar playing. It's a kid in a dorm room with his shirt off imitating Papa Lucia. This makes the look like this engine is intelligent. It looks like it's got this semantic ontology of music. And of music, there's guitar music and guitar music, there's Spanish classical music, and related to Spanish classical music, and perhaps the root of it is flamenco, and then there's this guy, Pablo Lucia, who plays guitar, and he adapts it so it's more jazz-like, and then there's different kinds of guitars that are jazzier or more classical, and there's dancers that dance this kind of music, which is related to him, it's got all these connections, and it seems to be able to just listen to Van Halen, which is more than I can do, uh, listen to Van Halen and understand that he's playing a goofy little ripoff of classical music. It looks like it understands all of this. It looks like somebody has engineered all this knowledge, and indeed somebody has. The 10 million or so people watching videos on the system, but not very many of them. Notice only 58 views on the top thing. Only 653 views for the kid in the dormer. So it's learned all this with just a few hints. This is reflected intelligence. This is intelligence of the users being reflected back through the recommendation engine to other users. The system itself knows nothing in the sense that we know it. But it exhibits intelligence, just not its own intelligence. It reflects it back. This is cool. And done with a search engine and just a co-occurrence test. Nothing more.
So recursive search reviews. So we have search reviews to make a recommendation engine, but then we recommend it in response to text. So we used a recommendation engine that was based on the search engine to implement a search engine, just because we could. Uh, so search can implement recommendations. Recommendations can implement search on top of each other, and you can get what looks really intelligent. This is kind of cool. How about something more useful to do with money? That sounds industrial. That's the fifth of these examples, the last. So the problem here is I used my credit card, the one I talked about earlier, to buy something somewhere. It happens that that store has been compromised. Either somebody in the store or somebody attacking the store electronically is stealing credit card numbers as they're used in that store. They don't cause fraud there. Later, when those credit cards are used, they are defrauded otherwhere. And the only hint is all of the people involved at one time transacted at that first merchant. So I call it merchant zero, just like patient zero in epidemiology. The infection started with merchant zero, and fraud spread across the land. So we're going to try to find merchant zero. And the meta goal is to show a way to screen algorithms, machine learning algorithms, without giving away any sensitive data. Now, the actual transactions here in a real bank are highly privileged. You're not going to get them. I'm not going to get them. But we might have brilliant ideas. But so are a thousand people claiming so. So how do we prove that we have a great idea if we can't get the data to prove we have a great idea? And they won't give us the data until we prove we have a great idea. How are we going to break that logjam? Well, the way is to simulate the data. We simulated data here. During the compromise period, we see a lot of accounts being stolen. During the exploit period, we see a bump in the fraud. Now, this is a very simple si so simulation. It seems too simple that, that it just generates transactions, doesn't even generate the details, doesn't generate any of the details of the fraud models. How can this be any good at all? Well, the key here is that in a training algorithm that is normally hidden away from the world so nobody can get to the data on it, what we can do is we can look at how live data behaves going into the trained system. It will produce various performance indices. How many false positives? What's the score distribution? And things like that. And if we make fake data that matches the KPIs, the key performance indications, I contend that the fake data is just as good as the real data for exercising the system. And if it's not, you have to tell me why it's not. There has to be something you can measure that says it's different. I immediately add that to the set of failure indicators, or KPIs, and I tune the random number generator, and now it matches even what you claim it should match. So if we have a sufficient set of KPIs, we can match those, we can get fake data that behaves just like real data. And it turns out it's very hard to match live data with enough fidelity to really be the same, because there's unknown cross-correlations and complexities in real data. But it's much easier because there are fewer constraints, and the constraints are all known. It's much easier to tune it to get KPI preserving fake data. Once we do that, we, we've done the matching inside the security zone. We can pass out of the security zone just the parameters of the fake data generator. These are not secure data. These are very abstracted aggregates, kind of like how many accounts are there in a little bit more odd form. And then we can generate new fake data outside the system and test a new system. If that new system works on this fake data, we can have pretty high confidence it's liable to produce interesting behavior, either a new divergence or a good performance on the live data. So we're able to build this system out here without ever seeing the real data. So we matched some simple KPIs in the system, and here are the results. Come on, come on. Here are the results. This is building tension. It works in practice like this. This is what the simulated results are. Here's merchant zero, popped way out of the noise. 
We've detected merchant zero by looking for co-occurrence with fraud. Merchant zero co-occurs more with fraud than other people do. Here's live data. Now, first of all, notice that there's an anomaly right here. And in about the same place, there's a very similar anomaly in the real data. There are more merchants in the real data. I should have tuned that up before showing this in public. But there's one merchant that shows way up out of the noise. So when the bank saw this, they, they, they tried this on their real data because they saw the simulated data. This is simulated. They saw this. They said, do it for our data. So we've gotten past the, the uncertainty. They were interested enough. They tried it on their data. They found one merchant that stood way out of the noise. They called the Secret Service. The Secret Service checked. Turns out it was a massive skimming operation. The other cool thing is this was also right next to the CIO's house. He often had a beer there and had been victimized several times this way. And so he thought it was good to get rid of them. But we found really, truly bad guys using this idea of simulated data. So the idea here, the algorithm here, is KPI preserving random data. You can get the open source code to do that yourself, if you like. It's called WASM. So here's the summary. We live in this new golden age. There's a new scale. This new scale has produced new simple algorithms, like I showed you, that can do very cool things. This availability of cool, simple algorithms that do cool things has represented basically a lowering of the tree. We, used, we took all the low-hanging fruit a long time ago. There's only a little bit of high fruit, but then big data has lowered the entire tree, and there's a massive amount of low-hanging fruit left. We have all kinds of things that we can do with cheap techniques like this, and all this code's available. So, are there any questions? How are we doing on time? Uh, we're a bit short of time, actually. So okay. Maybe one quick question. question. Quick question. What does beer have to do with machine learning? Why did Guinness beer contribute significantly to machine learning. The statistician who developed students. What was his name? I think we had the first student. That was not his name, of course. That was his pseudonym. Yeah, because, uh, because he couldn't, because his employer told him they would fire him if he published any of this stuff. So, there we go. That was great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like everyone to thank you for what was a wonderful talk. And we are running a little behind, so Ted will be hanging around for until um, 15 minutes after um, Tiberio um, finishes up. So if you have any questions or um, just want to know a little bit more about it, please feel free to come up with Ted or um, Ellen, who I'm um, sure will also be sticking around for 10 or so minutes. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to um, move on to introduce um, our second speaker for the night, Tiberio Katano. So Tiberio is the chief scientist at Ambiata, um, who I'm sure some of you heard about. Tiberio has spent, I guess, how many years in research and machine learning? Is it 15 or? More than 10. More than 10. <laughs> With several lips papers, probably more than 10 as well, or was it more than 20? I, I don't want to be um, incorrect in the numbers, but certainly more than 10. Um, Tiberio has um, did his, did his PhD in Canada on computer vision and spent, I guess, the last um, 10 or 15 years here in Australia researching um, various aspects of machine learning, um, a wide range, and in most recent years has, as chief scientist of Ambiana, actually been trying to make machine learning work in enterprise, and as you will hear from him very shortly, um, the problems in doing so are not unfortunate, oh, sorry, unfortunately not all technical. Um, there are people involved, and um, unlike digital, we have to deal with people, so I'm sure he'll, he'll be touching on a few of those topics. Okay, so take right over to you.
gave you a beta distribution, which of them would you address? The, the Bayesian, the Bayesian one. Yeah, and, and why is that? Because, uh, well, with some mathematics, the beta is the of the of the beta. Beta update to beta. Okay, that's good. That's your answer. <laughs>
Okay. Any comments from that? Guarantees, okay. Any timers? Any timers? So, concept of any timers that you can swap down with any point in time and still produce uh, sensible results. Interpretability? Inside. Inside? Yeah, so look, everything that I have here makes sense, okay? So, uh, there hasn't been a single, you know, uh, occasion in my life where I had an uh, stumble upon the importance of at least one of those uh, aspects in it. Okay, this is all. This is something that's important. Right? So I'm acknowledging the importance of all of this. But tonight I want to give a completely different story. Okay, I want to ask a very different question, which is this. Okay? I want to question the importance of learning how to do this. So it's a bit weird because I've dedicated about half of my life to this. Right? So it's pretty sort of strange that I'm coming here telling you that I'm asking this question, right? But first and foremost, I'm a scientist, okay? So the duty of a scientist is to always question yourself. You are the easiest one to fool, as Fine said. So let's ask this question. Do learning algorithms here? The first time I asked this question, I thought, do I really want to answer that question? And then I realized I really actually wanted to. To, to answer that question. Right? So this is what learning is. You get data, you have some people learning algorithm, you produce a model. Okay? And then after with that model, you can get some testing data, produce output by like using predict, uh, making predictions and so on. Right? So the hypothesis here is that this is not as big or as important as we think it is. It is less important. Okay? And Certainly, if you go out there in the wild, you will see this model. Many people talk about that. Who has seen this sometime? Okay? Uh, people love to, to, to portray this uh, caricature of what's actually going on in the real, in the real world of machine learning. Right? Yes, modeling is important, but it's sort of, if you don't get your features right, okay, if you're dealing with real data, if you don't know how to do proper cleaning, if you don't know how to do the proper pre-processing, okay, it doesn't really matter what you do after that, right? And people who work with data that comes particularly from enterprise systems, the legacy systems, and many of the data is not now machine generated, it's just generated by things called human beings, okay? And, <laughs> you know, many of you know what that means. It actually means that there's a, there's a form of complete mess. Okay, there is this importance of it. And then you can dig down into that, and you can ask some different questions now. You can say, okay, learning algorithms are important, but it turns out that in that particular thing called the real world, the real world, the wild world of millions of enterprises in the world, where data coming from you know, 100 year old legacy systems and merging all of that crap together to try to make sense of what the customers are doing, okay? Then you need to deal with this stuff, okay? You need to deal with this stuff. Then uh, I ask you, you know, what do you think is important? What do you think is important here? What's most important? Well, we have no more hands. Um, you should try some. <laughs> Entity resolution. What else? Huh? Feature engineering, but that, that's a really important. Right? The bunch of things here that are important, right? I won't claim that anything here is not important. Everything is important. There are cases where you have some of your data to be able to analyze it, otherwise not, nothing's going to work. Not going to fit in memory to run a simple algorithm and see whether there is any correlation between your label and your features, okay? Well, there are cases where you need to do feature selection, or you want to do feature selection to control other complexity, to be able to actually understand what's happening. There are cases where you may want to impute data, normalize data for linear models and so on. Right? Um, I'll buy removal. Uh, you have to do that, because it's everywhere in real world data, right? Look, these things are obviously important, okay? These dimensions, they do exist, and they acknowledge they are important. And, but 
you may think where I'm going now, right? So I'm going to ask a second question now, because I'm not happy. Do pre-processing steps matter? Okay? Now, what is coming, right? Do pre-processing steps matter? Okay. So, so, so here's the story, right? We had this thing called the learning algorithm. And then I'm trying to sort of share with you my view that this is not as important as we thought it was. Well, now I'm going to try to further push on that direction, try to convince you that this is even less important than we thought it was just two minutes ago. Okay? I think that the truth is more like this. Okay? We've got modeling there. I gave a generous 1% of importance for that. We've got data preparation. I gave 9% of importance for that. And we've got something else there. A blue, mysterious blue. Okay? That uh, accounts for 90% of the importance. Okay, so the next question is, what's the blue? Having the data. Having the data. <laughs> Huh? Dark energy. Energy? Dark energy. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Really... I, I wish I had ten had another book. I'll give it to you. Huh? What's the question? Okay. Okay. Okay, that's interesting. That's getting very cool. It's getting warm. Finally. I know for a fact that Daniel is a true scientist. That's why he said, where is the question? Okay. My first thought science is my old just a bit so. Okay. We'll get there. We'll see what the mysterious blue energy is. Um, but the problem of machine learning is that people are always talking about the machine. Alright? And they forget that there is a second word of learning that they also need to think about. Okay? They need to think about learning. And by the way, learning, the machine word in the term machine learning should not distract you from understanding what actually learning is. Learning is just learning. Okay? If you have data, then you learn from data. You don't have data. What do you do? You don't do learning, right? Oh, okay. You do learn still, but from all the stuff. Okay? And one thing that's very common for machine learning people, because we are all sort of aficionados of algorithms and technical things and mathematics and beauty of programming and everything, is that we just get caught into this little world where we think that it's machine learning. Okay? And the rest doesn't. Okay? Too bad, because that's a complete disaster. Okay? That takes most of our energy to the wrong places. That takes all working hours, or eight or six or seven, whatever you do, okay, to the wrong direction. It's not hard to make a case that most people are working on problems that are just wrong. Okay? Because they've been told by someone who thinks that they know what the problem is, who has been told by someone else who think that their problem is another problem that it isn't. Because the person who formulated the problem in the first place doesn't know anything about how to ask questions. Because for that, you need something called scientific truth. And you need to have, as well, business act if you are in the business. So I'm sorry to say, both of you Okay, are uh, probably not working on the right problem. And I'm saying this deliberately because I want everyone to ask this tough question. Same tough question that I ask myself when after having written 50 papers in machine learning, as what well, is actually learning important? Machine learning, learning how it are they? I want, I want all those questions to be asked, okay? Francis Crick, for those who don't know, was the guy who discovered the 3D structure of DNA with, with uh, Jim Watson. He articulates this in a pretty nice way. 
the major credit I think Jim and I deserve is for selecting the right problem, number one, and sticking to it, number two. It's true that by blundering about, we stumbled on gold, but the fact remains that we were looking for gold. Okay? Now, if you take any great scientist in history, at some point, if you look on Wikipedia or Google, you will find a statement like that. You will find a statement like that about Bohr. You will find a statement like that about Einstein. You will find a statement like that about Oppenheimer. You will find a statement about it about every great science. They're all saying the same thing. Okay? Now, you may think, well, this is actually science. I mean, uh, we are here in the world of actually transforming things into reality and business and, and so on. Well, it turns out that that's what the best business people also say. You need to know what is the problem you're solving. You need to truly understand it. Okay. Now, you don't want to be this guy who's obviously looking for the keys in the wrong place, okay? Um, just because there is light, it doesn't mean you should look there for the keys. Okay, the keys are not where the light is. And it turns out that the light today is all pointing in some direction. Okay? But everyone knows what direction is. Okay? And you may find something there, but you may not find the keys. Okay? So there are lots of hidden places, okay, where it's very dark. It's very, I can tell you, it's very dark, okay, because because you don't have the torches that allow you to find the pieces of information that you need to find to actually bring the puzzle together. You sort of have to figure out in the dark, okay. Well, that's not the enterprise. That's called enterprise. Uh, real enterprise is not internet properties where they are so advanced that these problems don't happen to the same extent. You still will have problems like that, but not to the same extent. But they're already born in the digital age. Okay? Now, picking the right problem, sticking to it. Well, as Rami alluded to, I could be spending a lot of time here just telling you how hard it is or to convince a business person that they should spend 90% of their effort and energy on trying to figure out what the heck they want to do. Okay? But that's almost impossible. I found that. But I'm going to tell you what my experience is, and this is my personal experience. I'm not really claiming any generaliz generalizability power. You know, being a machine learning person, I know what that means. This is well, I'm a sample of one here. But it's true for my experience, okay? And uh, that was claim of science, but it's some principle that can help. But the first thing is think subtraction, okay? When Michelangelo was also, uh, asked about the idea, he said, how could you produce something like that? He just replied, well, <laughs> it's very easy, okay? I just got rid of the extra stuff, okay? I just basically carved him out of the stone. He was there all along. I just carved him out of the stone. And this is an important analogy. Now you need to think about this, okay? Think about this. Because of pervasive human folly, almost any interventions that humans are making at this point in time are doomed. Therefore, if you withdraw those interventions to find a way of preventing people from doing the stuff they are doing, you will very likely solve a very important problem. Uh, and I'm not telling you this just because I read the test textbook or something. I'm telling you because I actually experienced this in my career, working with real enterprises. You know, people want clients want to make more money, more profitability, okay? So they want, for example, let's talk about okay, so marketing department wants to make more money, right? By refining their marketing strategies, okay? So you would, what would you think? Well, the more clever, creative, clever offers, let's get all the behavioral economists and psychologists around, let's get them come up with the smartest possible creatives, let's get, let's get the best machine learning people around, to actually figure out the best implementation of console sampling so we can really optimize 
for revenue or long-term profit or whatever. Okay. Okay, let's do that. Well, that's one thing you could do. Another thing you could do is to ask the following question. What if we shut down the market in the bank? <laughs> you could ask that question, right? It's a bit hard, I can tell you, because we've tried, but... <laughs> um, but there's one thing you can do. You can't shut down the marketing department, but you can simulate a micro department where you do shut down the marketing department. That's called experimental design. You can run experiments. Okay. Well, and I can tell you that that will enable organization to make significant improvements because we know that the solution, the optimal solution by far is to fire the time <laughs> Okay, so when I'm talking about Michelangelo here, you remember that. And that is true. Just because people just do stuff, because there's a natural bias towards doing stuff. Why? Because it's measurable. Well, I'm doing stuff, so we can measure and doing stuff. So it must somehow result in some interesting or valuable results. That's all bullshit. There's absolutely no philosophical or logical principle that would support that argument. Okay? So if you just randomly pick a job or a person or a activity that's been, and just shut it down, Maybe it's more likely that you will actually solve an important problem than if you devote your entire life to build something. Okay? So I've got a few lists of other things that you could think about in terms of which question you should be asking when you make choices about what to do, what not to do, which problems to address, which problems not to address. They involve causation, thinking about causation, they involve measurement, thinking about measurement thinking about experimentation, thinking about ethics. And I'd like to close that because whatever we do, we don't know the consequences of what we do. But one thing we know, we know our intent when we do what we do. We can't predict consequences. Well, we're trying machine learning, but forget, okay? The world is too complicated. We can solve very simple problems. Well, but the real hard problems we still can solve, okay? So one thing that's really important and will be more and more important in the future is, the, is your ethical stance. Because you don't have to predict ethics, okay? Ethics is about your intent. Ethics is about what you're trying to do. And ethics is what guides it's what guides causality, it's what guides measurement, it's what guides everything, ethics and business, right? Guides all of these things that we are trying to do. So I should stop there, but I'll just leave you with this thought that uh, an ethical, a strong ethical stance is going to be, in my view, in the future, the fundamental pinnacle upon which all of the science and machine learning and research and, and business. Thank you. Thanks, Abel. Um, so Ted's, Ted's here and Tomer is here, and I think just to round off the night, I'd like to do two things. I'd like to give an opportunity to ask a question of Ted, a question of Tomer, and then just make our normal job announcements session um, at the end. So firstly, a question for Ted. Is there a question for Ted? Up the back there? Just shout it out. I'm wondering whether um, you or the greater machine learning community gets any um, relevance to the severity of the error. Would um, machine learning was inherently inductive? Uh, I'm wondering whether um, you care about the severity of the errors that you could potentially make in your models. So you have to always account for the fact that the coin may not be there. You have to put a certain amount of conservatism uh, into every prediction you make. Uh, you have to decide that you may have made a serious mathematical error in the derivations. 
all of these sorts of conservatism are essentially the conservatism which says, I could be wrong. I could be wrong about what I do now and what the consequences may be. I could be wrong about whether or not induction was leading me through just a temporary phase and suddenly the world changes and then the inductive assertions that I make are no longer true. But you must always remember that that coin may not be there. It may be wrong. And so that's where I think the, 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 the allowance that you ask for needs to come in. If I prove something to you, you should not believe it 100%, even if I give you a totally convincing argument. You should put some error possibility on the possibility that I'm wrong, totally convinced that I'm right, but I, I may be convincing to you, but I may be still be wrong, or even that I have a nefarious role in trying to convince you of something that's wrong. You should always have that doubt about what is happening and what you do. But the um, coin flip game, for instance, it's a game I'm still, I'm still playing. So I can choose probability of 0 or 1. I'm, I'm still engaged in this game. What happens if I'm wrong and I die? All the world ends, for instance. And these are some of the, um, these are some of the problems that machine learning will ultimately face. Where it's not so much we have to understand that there's a possibility we could be wrong, and even that possibility might be very small. But the severity, if we are wrong, is largely unknowable and so severe that perhaps we shouldn't play at all. Oh, I generally can consider dying as sucks. So, uh, I think destroying the world is somewhat worse, even if I'm gone. Uh, it comes down to ethics, like uh, Tiberio was talking about. Uh, ethics are often a guide when we're in the mud of execution, and trying to do something. Uh, ethics and philosophy are our compass that help us going at least in the same direction, perhaps not the right direction. And you're right that consequences are often not normal. They, they appear to be from uh, unstable uh, distributions that don't have defined variance and so on. We need to be very aware of that possibility and very aware of the possibility that the consequences of what we do could be much worse than we do. I think that the 2007 and 8 showed that a lot of people had become too complacent with too, too confident relative to their own capabilities and the consequences of their mistakes. Sure, absolutely. And I certainly try to do that, and I'm sure that I do it wrong as well. So I'm even doubtful about how doubtful I should be. But I think it's important to do that. Can I first one more question? Do you want to go back? For whom? Oh, for um, close talking about ethics, and Ted touched on it a bit more, but how do you define ethics in the context of business problems or solving problems? I don't have a good answer for that. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, no, but not to dismiss the question, I think that. Uh, hello? And in alphabetism, in climbing, 
there are decisions you make, decisions that put yourself at risk, put others at risk, that you may chip on the rock and make a new hole, change things. You may protect yourself by things that other people don't appreciate. Their style is defined as the system that you use to decide how you climb that affects nobody else. It affects only yourself and how you reach the top, challenge yourself. Ethics are the, the system that you use to decide how you climb that affects somebody else. Do you break a hold off? Do you cut a new one? That affects the climb for him. That becomes ethics, no longer style. And a much more important question. The one related notion, the classical philosophical notion of an ethical stance is defendable. If everyone takes that stance, they won't be worse off. <coughs> Thank you.